Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. I'm Emily Hicks, and you're listening to the Elder Law Hour, where we're offering insights and solutions for today's seniors so you can age with confidence. Today's episode is going to be with Adam Fannin, who is a financial advisor, and we're talking all about retirement planning and financial planning. But so I thought this week it would be interesting to start out with a great article that I just read on The Motley Fool about three things you should know about Medicare. And I thought this might be helpful to our listeners. Number one is enrolling late could cost you for life. Medicare eligibility begins at age 65, but that doesn't mean that you can only sign up on your birthday. It, you actually get seven months to enroll on time. That window is going to begin three months before the month you turn 65, and it ends three months after that month. Now, you may not be in a rush to sign up for Medicare once you become eligible, but you should know that delaying your coverage could be costly. For each 12-month period during which you're eligible for Medicare, but you don't sign up, you'll face a 10% surcharge on your Part B premiums for life. So now there are some cases where you can delay your enrollment without a penalty. If you're covered by a qualified group health plan during your initial enrollment window, then you get more time to sign up. But otherwise, be aware of the penalties that might ensue if you wait on enrolling because those penalties are for life. Number two is you can't fund a health savings account once you're on Medicare. And the great thing about HSAs is that they're really flexible. You can withdraw money at any time for healthcare expenses, and you can invest funds that you don't immediately need to add to their growth. They also offer you a tax break on contributions. And because of this, you may wanna keep funding yours once you enroll in Medicare. Unfortunately, that is not possible. Once you're on Medicare, even if it's just Part A, which some seniors sign up for independently of Part B, the HSA contributions are really off the table. But don't worry, you can still withdraw from your HSA as a Medicare enrollee. In fact, it's a good idea to reserve your HSA for retirement if you can, since that's when your healthcare expenses might be at their highest. So I thought that was really interesting that you can no longer contribute to an HSA once you are on Medicare, but you can continue to withdraw. The third item that we have are about surcharges. Medicare is often hailed as an affordable health coverage option, but there are certain costs that you'll incur off the bat, including having to pay a premium for Part B. Now, each year, there's a standard monthly premium established for Part B, but if you're a higher earner in retirement, you'll be slapped with a surcharge that makes Part B more expensive. If you're not sure whether you qualify as a higher earner, In 2023, surcharges apply to singles with an income of more than $97,000 and couples with an income of over $194,000. So to put it another way, you don't have to be super rich, but if you're comfortable and you have are a higher earner, then you will have that surcharge apply to you. However, you should know that surcharges increase also as your income does. So a senior who is single and earning $400,000 a year, let's say, will face a higher premium than someone earning $100,000. So Medicare is a great and it's an essential program, but it's important to know the ins and outs of how it works. So as we get closer to the Medicare enrollment date, we're going to be keeping you up to date with all of the changes and what you can expect for 2024 and the years to come. So we have a really great episode for you today. We are talking about finances and we are talking with a financial advisor on how we should, how and when we should start planning for retirement, what the different retirement accounts are and how 
to navigate between those, and then some strategies to maximize social security benefits. And we're also talking a little bit about inflation and how that affects our retirement plan. So let's get to it. My guest today is Adam Fannin, and he is a financial advisor with Truist Wealth. So thank you so much for joining us today, Adam. I'm really, really excited that you're here because there's so many good topics that we can talk about that I think our listeners will really get a lot out of. So thank you for being here. Uh, Great to be with you, Emily. Thanks for having me. Of course. So Adam, how did you get started in financial planning? What brought you to that industry? Great question. Uh, So I started out with another very large bank, um, and I I, uh, came to my current firm, uh, Truist, uh, about 19 years ago. But I've always had a passion about planning investments, um, you know, saving for retirement, planning for the unexpected, those type of things. Yeah, that's right up my alley. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about Truist? Um, for those who aren't familiar with the the institution, could you tell us a little bit about um, you know what you guys are about? Sure. Um, so Truist is uh, one of the larger um, regional banks uh, within the country. Our, our footprint is primarily here in the southeast. Uh, okay. We take a uh, you know, a, a needs-based approach to people's financial lives, and we want to build and inspire uh, better, better, better lives, and through through financial planning is is one of the avenues that we do that. Yeah, and yep. So we we have a, a number of of different segments. Uh, I'm in the, our wealth segment. Um, we also have a commercial segment, uh, and so we we put the client in the center of the room and, and bring the appropriate resources uh, that, that, that we see necessary. That sounds great. That's um, exactly what you would want. So speaking of, so how do you get started if you haven't been working with a financial advisor and let's say you're just winging it? <laughs> how would you get yeah. started? How would you recommend someone? How does someone find you? How do they get started working with a financial advisor? It's it's a, a process. I'm sure you're some you're you're familiar with. Um, you know, it starts with a just a conversation, right? Uh, d- discovery, have an understanding of what the family's values are. Uh, you're you're trying to determine uh, whether or not uh, an advisor is a good fit for you and your family. I'm sure. Um, you know, discussing fee arrangements. Um, you know, just having an understanding of 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 uh, what what their what their value values are and, and and taking inventory yeah what their goals are really for the future right because i mm-hmm. have found that no two families are exactly alike <laughs> everyone right. has a different uh there are different dynamics and then there's also just different goals and you know expectations throughout people's lifetimes so it can be can be a challenge sometimes but i find you know that part is really exciting and interesting and kind of keeps us going as uh, planners, you know, trying to help different types of, um, you know, families reach their goals. But so what exactly, (laughs) this sounds like a kind of silly question, but what exactly do you guys do? I I mean, what is it that you do? If I say, okay, Adam, I'm going to hand you, I've saved a hundred, let's just start a hundred thousand dollars. That's an easy amount of money. So what, you know, what do, what do you guys do with that? Yeah, sure. So um, a lot of what we do is, is get clients organized, uh, taking inventory of those resources that they have currently, um, understanding okay. those values, um, starting to kind of set some realistic goals and expectations, um, identifying possible solutions for, for any observable gaps uh, during that process, and then you know monitoring our progress. Gotcha. Okay. And typically, I mean, I would assume that if you are someone like my dad, okay, who started working, when he started working, he saved 11% from the very first paycheck to when he retired, he saved 11% per paycheck without fail 
his entire life. Okay, so most people may not be that diligent about it. Um, I would assume that if you start at an earlier age like he did, you you know most likely will be better off. But you know, when should someone start planning for retirement? Well, you know, you said it right. So the obviously the sooner the better, uh, considering the time value of money. Um, but right. you know, it's never too late to start. Uh, some folks come to us with with student loans. Uh, you know, others uh, are are high earners, not retired yet. Um, you know, just uh, obviously the time value of money, you know, uh, is, is the biggest, uh, it's, uh, you know, one of the biggest. Um, yeah, because it's something like if you, and I don't have these numbers, but if you start at 25, I mean, it just exponentially increases. But for those of us who aren't 25 anymore, <laughs> let's say you're starting, you know, a little bit, you um, a little bit later in life. I think one of the um, the big issues that my clients have is just planning for all of the the ups and downs that may happen in life. You know, they're planning mm -hmm. for, you know, what happens if someone gets sick? Um, how do we plan mm -hmm. for, you know, retire uh, retirement costs and, and maintaining lifestyle in retirement, but also, you know, medical costs are a very, very big uh, topic for us. And, you know, perhaps college, you know, saving for kids college, things like that. Um, how do you know if you'll have enough money? Do you guys have some kind of fancy software or <laughs> some kind of uh, formula that you can plug someone into and just say, okay, let's, let's say I want to have, you know, $100,000 a year um, when I retire in income. So is there a way that you guys can just take a look at everything and say, okay, this is what you need to do? Because I, I'd really want to know, you know, if I'm looking at retirement, how I can have enough money um, and feel safe enough to go ahead and retire. So how do you guys uh, handle that? <laughs> yeah, so so yeah, part of our process and, and, and as we kind of take inventory and, and the best way to do it is, is to track uh, what you're currently doing, what, what contributions are going to your retirement plans, what what savings you, you know, are occurring, what expenses you're incurring uh, today, um, and then you know, based off those resources, um, you know, we may not be able to solve all every every problem uh, and still have your plan be in confidence. But uh, to your to your point about software, yes, we we have lots of uh, resources that we use. Um, you know whether it's uh, you know Money Guide Pro or, or or some of these other planning uh, tools that are out there, depending on the the complexity of the the family's needs. Yeah. Uh, whether we need to do some cash flow planning, uh, integrating uh, things like pensions, resources uh, from Social Security, those things that cover everyday expenses. So you know, and then and then planning for stress tests, uh, understanding or that their you know investments don't have a a nice uh, uh, sequence of returns uh, that repeat. Uh, they, there's there's variability to those, uh, and understanding the client's risk capacity, um, as well as their risk preference. Right, because not everyone is the same. I mean, a lot of people. I always say kind of risk tolerance. You know, when I talk to people about asset mm -hmm. protection and things like that, it's Absolutely. not really you know so much. Um, the quantity, you know, you look at, you know, equity, you look at different things. I mean, that's specific more to real estate, but you look at uh, what's your exposure, you know, perhaps um, mm -hmm. what is your risk tolerance? Because, you know, I've found that that varies wildly <laughs> with people. I mean, some people yeah. are, are just, they, they really don't want to have any exposure. I mean, they just really want to, to keep everything as, tightly buttoned up as they possibly can. And other people are like, okay, you know, I can maybe have a million dollars in, in, you know, one basket, so to speak. So that would be up for grabs if possible. But, you know, everyone really does have a different idea of how much they're willing to, to risk. Um, and so I guess that mm -hmm. speaks to, for you guys, you know, what, kind of assets they're willing to invest in. Like if they're looking for something that may 
be a little riskier, but perhaps a greater return, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, understanding their risk preference versus their risk capacity uh, is, a, is a big one, right? And, yeah. um, and understanding the, the range of those outcomes, right? So if it's a highly predictable asset, uh, you know, they probably won't have a lot of variance. Um, uh, if it's a more uh, less predictable asset like stocks, um, you, mm -hmm. know, you, you, you can have a, a very wide range of out, uh, outcomes as we've observed in the last decade. Gosh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So usually when someone comes to me when I plan with a family, I see a yep. lot of the same types of assets that people have and it's generally, you know, they have their real estate, um, you know, their personal home, maybe they have an investment property or two. And mm -hmm. then they have their, obviously their bank accounts. And a lot of people also will have a 401k and or an IRA. And that, mm -hmm. you know, is, are those the typical types of retirement accounts that, you know, people should be investing in? Or do you, do you guys recommend a certain IRA over another? Because I know there are different types and I just kind of wanted to go over maybe what's the difference between like all of the different types of retirement accounts. And maybe we can start with a, a 401k. Is that usually set up with an employer or can you set that up as yeah. an individual? Right, right. So yeah, uh, usually starts with what um, what's offered through their, their employer. There's lots of, gosh, there's lots of, Acronyms that are thrown out there. You hear 457, 403B, yeah. you know, 401k, uh, SEP, IRA, Roth. What does all this mean? Um, <laughs> so, so it's a little I, I, you alphabet know, soup sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So you know, just think of things very broadly and and and, and how they're 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 taxed. Um, okay. Uh, taxable accounts, tax deferred accounts, and then tax free. Um, so, you know, three three broad uh, tax types, uh, and, and most of what you talked about are, are those tax deferred, uh, tax favored accounts. Okay. And uh, you know, four hundred one k, IRA, uh, Roth IRAs are, are are great depending on again the the resources of the family, um, you know, what it is they're trying to accomplish. Um, are we planning for, for, for two lives? Is this uh, something that we're planning for, uh, you know, to, to leave on uh, to the kids? Uh, re really, what are we trying to accomplish here? Uh, do they have long-term care? Um, you know, is, is if they can't, uh, can't transfer that risk, you know, how, how, do we, how do we do it elsewhere? So, so all of these different tax types can, can aid in, in the, uh, the viability of that plan. So with a Roth IRA specifically, are the yeah. taxes, when you contribute to that is, is it, when is that taxed out? Do you pay the taxes going into that or is the, are the taxes paid the, when you withdraw? Those are, those are after tax dollars that you're contributing to, to the Roth IRA okay. and based off of uh, your age uh, and, and the time in the barrel. Uh, I like to say um, <laughs> it, there'll be there'll be a time where you can in, in the future take those dollars out tax free. Okay. So it, it's yep. Um, so those are after tax dollars. If you think that uh, taxes are going to go up in the future, maybe that's a, a good fit for you. Um, maybe maybe you know if you're planning for one uh, a survivorship standpoint where where there's just one uh, spouse. Uh, maybe doing some Roth conversions now um, might be a might be appropriate. Uh, just it just depends on each family. And does that give you a little more flexibility with your investing if you have a Roth IRA? I get a lot of questions about how do I use my um, IRA in real estate, and so mm. does it have to be a Roth IRA if you are doing something like that? Real estate specifically, mm -hmm. those would be self-directed. Um, okay, that, so that's, it doesn't not necessarily a Roth or traditional. It's a self-directed. Yes, okay. um, and, and I'm not a tax expert, but uh, uh, those self-directed investments um, they can be complicated. I'm sure you know. Yeah, um, and, and there's, there's lots <laughs> yes, of little uh, hur hurdles that you need to 
uh, overcome uh, to make sure you're in compliance. Um, but gen in general speaking, you know, Roth IRAs or dollars that you put in after tax, you, you've already, you know, paid Uncle Sam from your W-2 or, or however, your 1099, well, you have to have reportable income. Uh, and so those dollars are, are going after tax uh, to be potentially tax-free uh, later on okay. down the road. So, mm -hmm. as And that's opposed to a traditional IRA, which is, you know, maybe what most people have. I don't really know. I'm not going to speculate on what most people have, but I would assume based on what I see most people having is traditionally they have a traditional IRA. And that is where it's tax deferred. Is that correct? Yeah, depending, again, you know, uh, those tax defer, whether they get a deduction for that or not is based off their income. Um, okay. There could be a, a deductible contribution versus a non-deductible contribution. And um, so, you know, again, what uh, current resources are in, in the plan, what future contributions and, and assumptions are made uh, will depend on, on, whether which one is, is right for you and your family. Right. Okay. So for just one more question on the tax part. I know you're not a tax expert. But no, I, I'm not. <laughs> I am not either. And I don't even pretend to be one, which is why I defer to professionals, um, you know, yeah. On, on that. But with a 401k, that like, okay, so that's usually set up with your employer. And that is where your part of your paycheck usually is withheld, right? And just goes to your 401k. And that's going to be pre-tax or after-tax dollars. Well, you know, look, there, there's no one size fits all here. Um, okay. You don't have to do one or the other. You can do them all. Um, oh, okay. You know, so it, you can it, do it however you want to do it. Well, you know, uh, right. You know, a lot of uh, 401ks now allow for Roth contributions. And um, so that's a, a great way for, you know, a higher earner to uh, stuff money into a tax uh, free vehicle. Uh, they're paying that's on true. those uh, taxes today. If they're making it as a Roth contribution, there's matching uh, contributions. So those those uh, what we call 415C limitations are higher with 401ks than you know your traditional IRA is limited uh, to $6,500 plus the you know thousand dollar catch up contribution uh, if you're over a certain age, whereas the 401k allows for a much bigger contribution, so potentially a, a supersized Roth potentially. Um, so it really just depends on what um, what what program you're you're. Uh, eligible for if, if you're if you're working if you're self-employed uh, you could do a self-directed or you know a solo k uh, type plan uh, there's again there's just a whole host of potential solutions that, that could be suitable for you uh, but I a gotcha. financial plan will give you a, your guiding light it's really not as black and white as I'm trying to make it, is it? <laughs> it's yeah. really not. You can really no. do a lot of different things, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the beauty of planning is is, is putting it down on paper and, and uh, understanding, you know, making some basic assumptions and then stress testing for, for those what ifs. Okay. Well, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks, and we're talking today to financial advisor Adam Fannin about retirement, about financial planning. And one question that I've been wanting to ask you, and I know you're going to tell me it depends, but I'm going to try to give you a scenario perhaps. Um, how sure. should one allocate their investments? Um, we always want to balance the risk and the return, but as you approach retirement, you know, are you looking at these things differently in the different life stages? Um, because I would assume, you know, someone my age, very um, not close to retirement, <laughs> not well, closer than maybe I want to be, but, um, you know, how, you know, I'm in the peak earning years, I guess, is yeah. really what the um, the life stage I am supposed to be in right now. So, you know, sure. what, how do you approach, you know, someone that is maybe in their 40s, as opposed to someone that's getting ready to retire? So, um, 
I think the best thing we can do, all of us can do, is, is have an understanding of what our basic living expenses are and be conservative about, um, you know, how we account for those. So you can't really improve what you don't track. So, so track your expenses. Uh, there's lots of software out there that, that, that can do that. Um, and then I guess start, start by backing into what your future needs are, right? So yeah. align your, your, your basic living expenses with uh, sources from guaranteed income like Social Security, uh, perhaps a pension, uh, then have an understanding about what uh, your your personal beliefs are about about risk. Uh, if you're if you you know you might be young, uh, uh, a high earner uh, with twenty plus years, but have a very low um, tolerance for for variability. So that's yeah, exactly. just going to require more contribution up front. Um, so understanding your risk preference versus your risk capacity. You know, you, you could be young um, but and, and afford to take risk, but you just don't want to take risk, right? So, right. Um, so it's just going to require a little bit more uh, savings up front um, so that, you know, so that, again, there's no one size fits all, but but uh, in, in the situation you're talking about, uh, depending on the risk capacity and risk preference. Yeah, I think, I think that my risk preference is a lot different than my husband's risk preference, which he is, you know, I'm a little more conservative and he is not. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> so that can be quite challenging sometimes. Very common. Yeah, I'm very sure. Common. Right. Do you, do you find that, um, this is probably not a very PC question to ask, but I wonder, you know, if, um, a lot of times the, the women in relationships, tend to be a little more on the conservative side. I think we're just maybe wired that way, um, you know, because we're wired to to worry more about safety and security perhaps than men are, but um, I, I just find it. I, I, honestly, I find it both ways. I, it's, yeah. it's funny, you know, I've been doing it for a while and I'll, I'll find where, you know, the husband doesn't want to take the risk. He might be, a, a, let's say he's older, uh, and as a, a, a younger wife, um, you know, she, she might have a little more risk um, capacity uh, because of the, the the length of the financial plan, right? So if we're yeah. planning on- Yeah, a little more uh, time uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah, time, time, in the, time in the barrel, time in the tank. So, yeah. um, yep, so it, 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 it's, uh, it's but, 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 you know, it, you're right. I mean, as you said, it, it, can, it can occur that way where, where one spouse, um, as a as a different opinion on risk, and we just have to account for that, um, and you know, solve for the one in the middle, kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. depending on how how extreme it is. I mean, if if uh, one spouse is you know no risk at all, and the other one's uh, very aggressive, uh, we have to find a a, a, a neutral uh, compromise. Some neutral ground. It's yeah, yeah. I'm I'm sure that's a that can be quite a challenge for you dealing with married couples. <laughs> because I yeah, find, yeah, yeah. I find yeah, it so, so, too. Yeah, so once we have a kind of an understanding of what the household's comfort level is, um, we can say, okay, well, you know, if we took this up once one notch, uh, we're still in the confidence range, even under you know, kind of duress. Uh, and, and you know, when, when I talk about stress tests, we're, we're stress testing for things like, you know, bear market, um, maybe a client has a concentration of public stock or a, an individual uh, employer uh, stock that they've acquired through the years or, or, or inherited assets from from their, their family uh, that just can't, you know, part with. Um, so we just have to understand, you know, what those, that those range of outcomes are. Uh, even under you know under the most dire situation, uh, we want to make sure that that it's uh, it's going to be a uh, not going to blow up the plan. Gotcha. So let's say that I'm a little bit older and mm -hmm. I am planning to retire in the next few years, and I want to maximize my social security benefits. <clears throat> mm -hmm. How? can I do that? Is it better for me to wait and draw social security later? Or what do you normally suggest for people that really want to maximize the benefits that they're drawing from social security? What do you suggest for them? It's going to depend upon their uh, demographics. Um, you know, uh, their, their, 
their family history. Um, you know, did mom and dad live? How long did mom and dad live? Uh, is there a, is there a, an age difference between husband and wife? Um, you know, and we will certainly show you the solution that maximizes the the the, the benefits out of the plan. Uh, we also need to consider, like, it, it, you know, if there's a pretty good age difference between um, spouses. Okay. Um, you know, maybe it's important to to defer. Uh, so we maximize the benefits to the surviving spouse. Um, we just need, we need to understand where the, the soft spots are in the plan, what the plan sensitivity is. Um, you know, those those will, uh, and, and then of course balancing that with, with other income sources. You know, some folks still have pensions out there. Right, I don't see a lot of them anymore, but I do see some. Um, and, you know, just so, every, <clears throat> just so our listeners understand too, with social security benefits, your spouse does retain a benefit, correct? And it doesn't pass on to children, but a surviving spouse actually does um, still is still able to draw some social security. Is that is that your understanding? Well, it, yeah, there's some some caveats. To it that. obviously depends uh, on uh, the situation, well, but generally, uh, perhaps assu assuming, yeah, um, you know, assuming that, that they are married. Um, if they're, you know, you you probably know uh, as, as as well as anyone, um, you know, if they've been married for at least ten years, uh, that that um, a non, you know, divorced uh, uh, folks have a, a potential uh, retained benefit there um, from from an ex spouse. Um, so, you know, understanding there's there's a we'll call it, what we call it a PIA amount uh, when you get that green used to get that green statement from Social Security that, that sh showed what your benefit was at based off your earnings earnings file and so we plug that into the system understanding what their uh, family history is what the, the potential um, you know how, how, how long we need to plan for uh, and then the risks associated with it so it's really going to depend on the um, uh, that PIA amount and, and whether you choose to you know take it early um, if you can continue to work obviously there's that that uh, the penalty um, so so it I hate to say it, but it, it, it really depends. Yeah, it really depends. That's my answer for everything. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm used to giving that <clears throat> answer to almost everyone that uh, asks me a general question. <laughs> yeah. Um, but let's say um, there's a lot of talk about inflation. That yes. There's just, you know, a lot of people are, are concerned. And obviously, I mean, if you just go to your local grocery store, um, you, you're feeling it. You feel the impacts of it right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, your everything seems to be prices just seem to be. You know, they, they keep going up. Um, people are getting more and more pinched. Um, mm -hmm. So, how do you see that impacting? You know, retirement and you know savings and income over time. I mean, how do you? Um, how do you talk to your clients about that? There must be a lot of people that are really concerned right now that are moving towards retirement. And, you know, obviously they've been saving and planning for a certain amount of income. So how does that reconcile with something like inflation um, increasing? So you're right. I mean, it's, it's, um, the, the, the giant has, has awoken uh, inflation's <laughs> back. Um, I guess the the firemen, the Fed is is on the on the on the scene and doing the best that they can to to uh, help with that uh, price pressure. But yeah, it, obviously it, it erodes uh, what you can do with your money um, over time. And and so for some folks that that means that they have to take some risk in order to to beat that uh, inflation hurdle. Um, and you know, depending on how soon they retire, um, you know, if, if if they're retiring at fifty versus sixty, you know, and sixty-seven uh, yeah. as normal retirement, um, that that hit, health, you know, healthcare costs, inflation, taxes. That that's a, that's a big um, stress test that that you know that can put put on the on the strain of the, the viability of the plan. So inflation's 
you know, we're, we talk about all the time. Um, I'm sure you guys uh, do. Yeah. Yeah. I hear a lot of, a lot of people are concerned, you know, it, it just seems like prices of everything, you know, keep increasing and, you know, um, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of relief for people right now. So I know it's a big concern. So let's move into healthcare expenses because this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart because we yes. deal so much with it. Um, in my practice, I handle a lot of elder law clients yeah. and those are clients specifically that are planning for long-term care normally is what I would define an elder law client being. And a lot of times that includes um, planning for Medicaid eligibility and, yep. um, and things like that. So do you guys, how does healthcare, how does, how do you factor in healthcare expenses with retirement and, you know, Medicare, supplemental insurance, all of those things that one, you know, acquires and thinks about as they're planning for retirement? How, how do you guys take those into account when you're looking at a plan? How do you, do you, you know, create the a, plan around those things or um, sure. how does that work? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great segue because, um, because healthcare, kind of dovetails from 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 inflation right so the the inflation rate for healthcare has historically been uh, much higher than than your basic living expenses um, and so we sort of account for that uh, we, we assign a different inflation rate for, for those expenditures and that's going to be a big bigger and, and bigger piece of uh, the you know the pie. Uh, of, of expenses uh, in retirement. So, yeah, it seems to be the number one concern of, of most people that I plan with, um, other than, you know, making sure the kids don't blow all the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so how depending are we going to pay for something? If I get Alzheimer's, how are we going to pay for it? That's what people are worried about. So, yeah. 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 Yeah, so so I mean, we would certainly rely on on experts like you to help us uh, devise documents that protect for those things that cannot be transferred, uh, risk 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 transferred. Uh, we you know rely on, on folks like you to uh, uh, craft a, a special needs trust or or some other type of vehicle that that would protect against those type of uncertainties and um, certainly things like, you know, uh, if you have a health savings account, if you're enrolled in a high deductible health care plan, uh, you're, you're a young family, um, you know, that's a, that's a good right way to accumulate money for that health care goal. Is there um, a limit to how much you can contribute to that, to a health savings account? Yeah, well, first off, you have to be eligible. Um, so you've got to be enrolled in a uh, high deductible uh, plan. Okay. Uh, and I, I don't have the um, the caps on, on what you contribute. But yes, there is a there is a cap on the uh, annual contribution uh, for, for you and your family. Um, but, but that's you know, those dollars. Yeah, those, those dollars can be used um, later on down the road. Uh, you don't have to spend them today. Uh, you know, time value money, if you can let those dollars continue to, to grow, you can use those, you know, later on for, for medical expenses. If you're not eligible to transfer um, that, you know, long-term care risk, um, sure. um, right? So you, you yeah. can use that. Okay, so that may be a really good strategy for people when, you know, we're thinking about this, maybe that goes on my checklist of, do you have a health savings account? Do you have an HSA? Um, that could perhaps help with some of those costs because I know, you know, I, I tell people all the time and everyone generally is pretty shocked with learning that Medicare doesn't cover long-term care. It does yep. cover it in certain circumstances where, your it's more of a recovery type situation maybe you've been in the hospital and you have right. a certain amount of rehabilitation that you can you know um, get in the nursing home something like that it will cover that up to 100 days i believe that it doesn't cover 100 percent of it for 100 days i think it's the first 20 days is a hundred percent and then after that there's a um, a percentage so 
it's a very huge deal. It's a really huge deal for people. I have a, a client right now that we just got approved for Medicaid and her her husband is in a nursing home and he has dementia and the bill mm. is over $12,000 a month. So yep. it's quite expensive. And he's been in there for 10 months, 11 months. Yeah. Her, her latest bill was, you know, well over a hundred thousand dollars. So it's pricey, yeah. and, and you really don't know with these, with these types of diseases, how long you're going to have them. You know, the, I always mm -hmm. tell people the average stay in a nursing home is 28 months, but right. I'm not sure that's really all that accurate now that, you know, more and more studies are coming cognitive. out. Yeah. yeah. And with a cognitive, especially Alzheimer's, because it seems to me, I'm not a medical expert, but it seems that that's, they call it the long goodbye. I mean, it really, it can mm. last for years and years and years. And, yeah, you know, absolutely. physically the person is, is healthy. It's just the, the memory and, and the um, other cognitive functions that aren't, you know, a lot, just create that situation where they need long-term care for a really long time. So it's a, yeah. um, you know, it's a, it's a big deal for us. And so it sounds like you guys take that into account, you know, when you're planning with someone, obviously you, sure. um, you know, are looking at their long-term care, whether or not they have insurance, which I find that most people don't, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. very expensive. And a lot of times people wait a little bit too late. You know, they can't, I don't think you can really get it after maybe your fifties. You know, I don't know. I haven't. I ha it certainly I becomes to, cost prohibitive. Yeah. 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 It's, it's mm -hmm. one of those things that if I have a client in their fifties and I tell them, you know, you should probably go ahead and look into it now because you may not be able to actually get that later. Yeah. So, so, you know, long-term care in my mind is, is, is kind of a stress test thing. It's not necessarily going to happen. Uh, but what if it does, what, what's the impact to the family? Uh, what's it going to do to the surviving spouse? Are they going to have enough resources? So you said it best. I mean, I've seen, seen it much higher than 12, you know, 10, $12,000 a month. Yeah. Um, you know, um, um, it could be very and, and 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 cognitive, especially especially as I'm sure as we're all well aware that uh, those those can those can go on for quite a while. Um, you know, they can be much much longer than the the typical average stay uh, yeah. in in a facility. So it's progressive, and and it, you know what I've observed, um, mm -hmm. and you know, love to hear your take on it, but. You know, it, it, sometimes it's uh, something that's you know maybe a couple hours just getting up, meal meal preparation, um, getting them transferring from 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 bed to to the yeah. breakfast table. Um, right, know, the, the, the uh, daily yeah. activities. Yeah. Right, right. Those daily activities of the living, and um, you know, so so that that expense obviously goes up uh, proportionate to the amount of care you need. So. That's uh, what you're talking about. It's the cat five scenario. <laughs> yeah. And it does progress. I mean, generally what I see in my practice is when someone gets a diagnosis and they plan to stay home and everyone mm -hmm. wants to stay home. I mean, that's the dream. That's what everyone wants to stay home and we want our families to take care of us. But the reality is that when the disease progresses to a certain point, your family are not, maybe they are, but most likely are not skilled nursing professionals. So it yeah. gets to that point where you really can't stay home. Um, a lot of people can, and that's a really, that's a great blessing for them if they're able to do that. And of course there are, you know, wonderful uh, programs like hospice and, and things like that. But a lot of times what we'll try to do in the beginning is apply for home health care through Medicaid, mm -hmm. let's say. Let's say we've gotten mm -hmm. them, you know, financially eligible for Medicaid and we apply for home health. The wait list for that is just astronomical. So most yeah. of the time, I I have a client actually that this just happened to. We applied last year, I think last April, 
mm-hmm. and we are still waiting. <laughs> but wow. um, but she actually had to end up going to the nursing home before we were able to get that because that program only has a certain amount of funding and that funding goes away quite quickly. Um, and yeah. it's based on the need. And she was actually very um, on very high need because she lived at home alone. But it's still, you know, with the the shortage of, of finances in the program, it just, we had to wait and wait. So unfortunately, she ended up having to go to a nursing home before we could even get any of her home health paid for through yeah. the Medicaid um, system. So that's a lot of what I see is everyone wants to stay home as long as they can. And I totally understand that. And there are so many places and and services that, you know, allow you to do that. It's just, there's not a lot of them. It's going to be quite expensive. So, you know. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the, that's the luxury, right? So, yeah. you know, there's this aging in place. Um, we've yeah. heard that, that term a lot. And it is, um, yeah. Yep. Yep. And so, um, you know, you, you know, that, that, um, um, we need to make sure we've got all the right documents in place, uh, for the family, mm-hmm. um, you know, you know, to, to, to make sure that, that we're protecting, um, mom and dad and, um, um, you know, and I know there's a lot of, Medicaid compliant annuities and things like that, you yep. know, that people can, um, yep. can yeah, there's, there's a couple of ways to transfer the risk. Yeah. Uh, you can use asset based care solutions, um, you know, insurance, whether it's a, a insurance based uh, policy, um, or an annuity based policy, yeah. if they've got existing resources that are already, you know, in, 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 um, some sort of tax, you know, with the Pension Protection Act, I think, you, you know, you know a lot about that, um, that you can transfer uh, a non-qualified um, fixed annuity into a, a long-term care compliant um, type of annuity that can provide a, a, a benefit to the family. Yeah, I had a client that did that recently, and it was a great mm-hmm. solution for them because mm-hmm. all of the other avenues that I presented, they didn't really fit into how they wanted to do it. It wasn't really part of what they saw their plan being. So, um, right. you know, for me, I, I deal with a lot of uh, uh, financial advisors and financial planners. And it's really yeah. a wonderful thing because I really feel this day and age um, that you need a team around you. <laughs> you really do yeah. need a yeah, team. Absolutely. and. And usually for me, that team is their financial advisor, myself, and perhaps a CPA. So yep. I can defer all of the hard tax stuff to him or, or her Golden because triangle. Yeah. I'm not going there usually if I can help it. I know enough to tell people just surface um, tax planning, but I really don't specialize in that as an attorney. I, you know, most estate planners, um, if you're shopping for an estate planning attorney, kind of go one of two ways. They go into tax planning or they go into elder law. And I am um, certainly in the latter, <laughs> um, right. helping to plan with a long-term care and things like that. So, but yeah, yeah we, it's, we, a, it's a team approach, would, correct? At, oh, 100%, 100%. We would, we would rely on folks like you and the CPA um, to, to come, come at it uh, as a team. You know, what's the best way to tackle this, this, this um, this goal, and um, there there might be, you know, uh, there might be a, a, a tax annuity that's out there that's that could be better levered for, for that type of care. Right. Um, yep. Yeah, you never you never know what's going to come up. Um, that's really the the theme of my of the show, and also of my practice <laughs> is you never know. <laughs> right. So we always right. have to plan for for the worst uh, for the worst case scenario. So, um, Adam, this has been really really helpful and really great. I really appreciate you being here. I think everyone can benefit from early planning, right? If they sure. if they start early, but yeah. even, 
even if you're later in life, I mean, don't be afraid, right? Even if you're in your 40s and you haven't done anything, you can still help those people, right? <laughs> or in your yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's just improving upon improving improving upon those outcomes, right? We're we're all trying to uh, understand what what resources that you have, or is there a, you know maybe a, a better approach that could be taken here to kind of improve the viability of your plan. Um, you know, make sure that your assets are titled correctly, that you've got, um, you know, beneficiary designations in place, all those essential documents, wills, trusts, power of attorney, healthcare directives, um, you know, all those, all, those, those all basic planning, which, which you are a, an expert, I'm sure of. I'm all over um, those things. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, and, one of the things though, that I always tell people, and I would, I just can't not say it since we're talking about it, is to make sure that your beneficiary designations are up to date. 100%. Is that not so important? Because- yeah, Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, because yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see the you'll see the ex spouse uh, yes. listed as a as a beneficiary on a retirement account, and as you know, that that's that's going to the ex spouse. Will will doesn't trump the the beneficiary designation. It, it exactly, and that's what I tell people. They're like, well, we designated it in the will to go a certain way, and I always say, well, it doesn't really matter <laughs> that you want right. it to go that way, because the right. beneficiary designations are going to trump whatever you write down wherever it is even if it's in a will but yeah right. um i i have seen that where the ex-girlfriend or the ex-spouse gets the oh my gosh the yeah. uh <laughs> the ira or or whatever you know asset it is and that does not go over very well with the new spouse or the new girlfriend let me just say so it does not no. or the kids for that matter yeah, as part as part of the review process, uh, looking at uh, those those things, making sure that you know as the uh, the rules change, right? Whether that's a law or a tech, you know how how retirement accounts are treated, um, beneficiaries, how they're how they're getting those accounts. Um, you know, it just it's just a review, uh, understanding. Um, Hey, this is how it is. Um, are you sure this is this this is the way you still want it? <laughs> right? You, sure you still want this person to, to right? 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 Oh gosh, gosh! I need to. No, that's not how I want it. Let's 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 revisit that. Yeah. And do you guys have a a uh, time in mind that you check on people, or do you just advise people to come back to you when life events happen? or maybe once a year, what's your time frame usually on that when you kind of, um, you think people should follow up with you? Yeah, so so we have a service model that, that we kind of adhere to and um, generally we'll, we'll do kind of a plan update uh, in, in one of those meetings. And so that, that that would occur, you know, at least on an annual basis to- Oh, okay, pay, oh, that's you good. Know, Yep, at least on the annually, and then uh, you know we we'll might be doing uh, investment performance reviews uh, with the client. Uh, it, we we take some of our cues from the client. You know how often do you want to hear from us? Um, <laughs> right. You know, some some folks don't want to meet that, meet all that often. Once is once or twice a year is is, is good. Other folks want to meet uh, a little more frequently. So um, you know we 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 cater that to to the client's preference. Well, that that's a great approach. I mean, once a year, I think is a great time to take a look at everything and just and see where you are, so that you can adjust your plan accordingly. Um, yep. Adam, thank you so much for being here today. If someone wants to get in touch with you and perhaps mm -hmm. they have more questions about all of this stuff, what's the best way to reach you? Sure, uh, you can reach me at uh, Adam Fannin at Truist com. Great. And we will put a link to Adam on our website to make sure that you guys are able to find him easily. You can go to the, um, sorry, go to elderlawhour.com and Adam's information will be there for you. And thank you so much again for being here. I think this was really educational and um, I, I learned a lot and I'm, I now understand that I cannot make um, retirement accounts as simple as I, I perhaps maybe wanted to. <laughs> but thank you so much for being here. And um, Oh, great. Great to be with you, Emily. 
Thanks so much. And uh, all right. All right. Take care. I'd like to end the show with a question that I've gotten recently from Judith. And Judith is concerned about estate planning because she says that she doesn't have a lot of assets. So she doesn't really understand why she needs a will or in fact needs to do any estate planning at all. So you might think that estate planning is just for the wealthy, those with vast estates or lots of valuable assets to distribute. However, that's a common misconception. Even if you don't have a lot of assets, a will is still a really crucial and vital document. And here's why. First of all, a will is going to allow you to decide what happens to your possessions. Even if you don't own a mansion or you don't really have a large bank account, you probably have some sentimental items or some personal belongings that you want to um, make sure go to the right people that you care about, or perhaps you even have pets that matter to you. Without a will, Florida is going to have a plan for you. I always say that if you, if you failed a plan for yourself, the state of Florida is going to have a plan for you and you may not like that plan. So the state's laws and regulations are going to determine who gets those items if you don't have that plan in place. By creating a will, you get to make those decisions yourself and you can ensure that your cherished possessions go to the people who will truly appreciate and value them. Now, the second reason a will is important is it lets you designate guardians for your children. And Judith, you may not be in that situation. You may not have children or you may have children who are grown, but if you are a parent, this is one of the most important reasons to have a will, regardless of your financial status. A lot of times younger parents come to me, they don't really wanna do a lot of planning because they don't feel that they have large estates. However, this is essential to do if you have minor children. In your will, you can name someone you trust to take care of your children if something were to happen to you. And that's going to ensure that your kids are looked after by someone you've chosen rather than leaving it up to a court's decision. Because I'm pretty sure that you guys aren't going to want to allow a judge that doesn't know you, doesn't know your family, decide the fate of your kids. That's not something that I want to risk. So I want to be in control and have my voice heard if I am no longer here. Now, a third benefit to having a will is that it just simplifies the process for your loved ones. Even if you don't have a sig significant amount of assets, your family will still need to navigate the legal and financial complexities that come along with your passing. Having a will can make that process so much smoother and less stressful. It provides clear instructions, it's gonna minimize confusion on their uh, behalf and it's going to speed up the distribution of your assets. And the last thing is a will can help support the causes and charities that matter to you. If you have a favorite charity or organization you'd like to leave a small donation to, a will ensures that those wishes are carried out. So a will is not just for the wealthy, it's really for everyone. It's a way to express your wishes, protect your loved ones, and ensure that your legacy is honored. So regardless of your financial situation, I really do hope that you take the time to create a will because it's responsible and a caring act that can bring peace of mind to you and your family. And please don't delay <laughs> because we know in life that you never know what's going to happen. You don't ever know what's around the corner. And keep in mind, it's not about the quantity of your assets, but the quality of the plans you make. So I hope this has been helpful uh, for you, Judith, and I hope that you will consider doing some planning if uh, only just for your family's sake. I think it's a wonderful gift and a wonderful consideration for them. So I hope this has been helpful for you. And please let us know if you have any other questions, you can send us a message on our website, elderlawhour.com. And thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Elder Law Hour. Again, if you would like to connect with me or learn more about today's episode, please visit us at elderlawhour.com. 
I am Emily Hicks, and we will catch you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. Join us this and every Saturday for the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. 